Okay. So tonight we'll be talking about ropes and knots. And uh, ropes and knots, very, you know, very important to what we do in the fire service as well. Uh, we use ropes for all manner of things. We're going to go through what we can be using ropes for. Uh, and we're going to be talking about a couple of different types of, uh, of uh, types of ropes, types of knots that we may come in contact with as we go. So please, if there are questions, pipe up. So we'll start off by talking about the different types of ropes that we have. There's uh, generally two classifications of rope uh, and the two classifications are on your screen. They are, the first one is life safety rope and life safety rope is used to support rescuers or, or victims during incidents um, or while we're training, of course. Uh, they must meet the requirements of, uh, there's an NFPA standard and that NFPA standard is NFPA 1983. Um, and the life safety rope can also be further classified into two specific categories of rope. And those two specific categories of rope are escape rope and water rescue throw lines. The other type of rope that, that we uh, often see in the fire service is utility rope. Um, utility rope is the type of rope we would use in any situation not involving life safety. Uh, there are no standard, uh, standard for requirements. Uh, with utility rope, we just want to follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Uh, in terms of the care and maintenance uh, of that rope. So again, in the CSRD at this point in time, we don't use uh, life safety rope uh, at, at this point in time. We don't do low angle or high angle rope rescue, um, but it's still important that we know about uh, life safety rope and, and learn about it. It is, it is part of being a fire. So we're gonna start talking about life safety rope. So again, life safety rope, solely used for supporting people. All right, uh, those two specific categories that I talked about before um, are escape rope. So with escape rope, we're talking about single use. It's, it's, it's only one for one use uh, and that's life safety. It's intended for emergency self-rescue situations, emergency uh, situations or self-rescue. Uh, it's designed to carry the weight of only one person typically um, and must be destroyed after use. Uh, with water rescue throw lines, uh, fl that's floating rope that's used during water and ice rescues. Uh, it can be tied around the rescue or thrown to the victim, and often that would have to that would have to support more than one body on that on a on a water rescue throw line. So NFPA 1983, as I mentioned, are the regulations for life uh, for life safety rope. Um, and in NFPA 1983, it states that only one block uh, <clears throat> only one block reel construction using a continuous filament virgin fiber for load bearing elements is suitable. So they're very very specific about the the requirements for life safety rope. Um, they require the manufacturers provide uh, information on the proper use, uh, inspection, maintenance procedures, um, and what is the criteria for retiring rope for service. Um, they also establish criteria for the reuse of, of life safety rope, so you can't have any, any abrasions or visible damage. Uh, it has not been exposed to heat or direct flame. It's not been subjected to any impact load, so a fall from height where the load actually had to, had to take more than your body weight because of the, fall, because of the weight uh, that, that happens when you actually fall. Um, it's not been exposed to liquids, <coughs> solid gas, mists, or vapors, or any chemical, uh, or any other material that might deteriorate rope. It's also passed an inspection that's been conducted by qualified personnel. Uh, with life safety rope, we require rope log books. Um, so the rope logs include things like the, uh, the product label, uh, any manufacturer's instructions, the purchase date, <coughs> use, Sean, maintenance, and inspection. can I just for a second? Um, your mic is uh, staticky. It's not as bad as it sometimes is, but if you can move the mic closer, it would be helpful. Okay. How's that? That's much better. Okay. So the requirements of the rope log, uh, again, product label, manufacturer's instructions, purchase date, um, use, maintenance, inspections, any, anything like that needs to be recorded in the logbook, um, and any impact loading incidents. So anytime that the rope has been used and it, uh, it had an impact load on it, uh, must be recorded uh, because a lot of you can't detect uh, when that's occurred uh, by our regular physical inspections of the rope. <clears throat> so NFPA 1983 also designates options for life safety rope that are subjected to impact loads uh, or if they failed inspections. And the two options you have are destroyed immediately altered and altered so that it can never, uh, it can never be mistaken for life safety rope again, uh, or it may be discarded and have the manufacturer's label removed, cut into smaller lengths and marked as utility, uh, which often is a, a good, you know, once we've done something, had an impact load on a life safety rope, cutting it up, using it for practice rope and things like that so we can practice our ropes and knots, great use of it. <clears throat> Otherwise, really there's no use for it after that. Are we good? 
Okay. Sean, Sean, we are having a little bit of problems with feedback and skipping of your voice. Okay. Uh, it's probably my poor Wi-Fi signal here. Is it okay right now? Right now is perfect. Okay. Yeah, I think it's good when you're closer into your uh, computer. and It seems like a problem with the mic instead of the Wi-Fi. The video is fine. Okay. All right. Well, just stop me if it happens again. Um, so utility rope is the other type of rope. Um, while NFPA doesn't regulate utility rope, uh, it should be inspected regularly. Uh, utility rope, uh, some of the considerations um, with utility rope, well, the uses. Uh, we use it to hoist equipment. We use it to secure unstable uh, objects or cordon off areas. Um, there are standards addressing the property care and use, uh, but they're not regulated by NFPA. We should still be inspecting our utility rope regularly because we use it to haul heavy tools. If they fail in a situation like that, it could land on someone below. Um, typically uh, and, and could cause injury. So a good inspection, visual inspection of the ropes is still advised. So ropes uh, are made with a variety of different types of materials. Um, two, the, the two basic categories those uh, types of, of materials can fall into are synthetic rope and natural fiber ropes. Um, the rope material is gonna affect the use and what we can use it for and the longevity, how long it will last. Um, natural fiber will lose strength when it wets. Uh, it rots very easily. Uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> and uh, it's very quickly being replaced with synthetic rope. Very seldom will you find natural fiber ropes actually in use in fire departments now. So with synthetic fibers, we're looking at things like polypropylene, polyester, nylon, uh, Kevlar, Spectra. They're, these are actual brand names. Um, their resistance uh, to water, mildew, mold, rotting, shrinkage, and the effects of ultraviolet light. Uh, some of the advantages of synthetic fibers, they have a much longer lifespan. Uh, and the second big one is that they're very strong, very lightweight, uh, so they can hold a lot of weight without, uh, you know, uh, and, and you can still carry them around. It doesn't take a lot of weight and uh, strength to move them around. Uh, and they're also very easy to maintain. Disadvantage with synthetic rope is that when exposed to heat, synthetic rope will melt. Natural fibers are things like manila, cotton, hemp, uh, some of the advantages with natural fiber ropes is uh, the resistance to sunlight. Uh, they do not melt when exposed to heat, and they will hold the knot very firmly. Uh, disadvantages when we're looking at natural fiber ropes are they're prone to mildew and mold. Uh, they deteriorate when they're exposed to chemicals, and they don't melt when they come in contact with heat. They will actually catch fire and burn if uh, they come into contact with embers in a direct flame. So a lot of times that, uh, that's not good for the one to work with. So with rope construction, uh, I've got a photo on, the, on your screen here of uh, four different types and uh, we'll go into a little bit more about them. But uh, common types uh, of construction used for life safety, we'd be looking at using a kermantle. A kermantle. Um, you, for utility, we're looking at uh, the three below that, the laid, the braided, or the braid on braid. So we'll talk a little bit about those different types now. So the kermantle. Uh, current mantle rope is constructed of, uh, of jacketed synthetic rope uh, and it's comprised of, bra uh, of a braided covering or a sheath um, over the core, which is the core is the kern uh, of the main load bearing strands. So the core runs parallel, uh, runs parallel with the length. Uh, it works in, conjun in conjunction with uh, the covering to increase the stretch resistance and the load characteristics. So um, Basically, uh, it's much better for supporting p the the weight of a body. If we were to if we were to put a person on the end of it, this is the kind of rope you want to be using. The sheath itself provides uh, the remainder of the strength, uh, and it protects the core from abrasion. So we need that sheath. It's going to make sure that you know anything coming in impact with the rope doesn't hurt the core. Um, a couple of different types of current mantle. You could have either dynamic or st or static rope. And dynamic rope is, high, is a high stretch type of rope. Um, it's usually used in situations where somebody might be subjected to a long fall and we don't want the abrupt stop that you'd get uh, with a static rope. Um, the dynamic rope will actually stretch and take some of the energy out of your fall uh, instead of just jerking forward uh, and uh, that could cause more injury, right? So it's designed to be elastic and stretch uh, when loaded without breaking. Uh, it's not typically used for rescue or hoisting. It's more of a climbing type thing. Static rope um, is the low stretch type of rope. 
so it's designed for low stretch without breaking, uh, and it has a limited range of elasticity. Uh, so with NFPA 1983, uh, there's a requirement there that says it must not elongate more than 10% under load equal to 10% of its breaking strength. So there are very specific requirements for how much a, a static rope is, is allowed to stretch. Uh, so these are used, and static rope is used for rescue, rappelling, hoisting, uh, when falls are not likely and only short falls are possible. So when we look at the rope construction for utility ropes, we have a couple of different types uh, of uh, utility rope. So the first one is the laid, also known as twisted rope. Uh, it's constructed by twisting fibers together to form strands. Uh, then you take the strands and you twist them together to make the final rope. Um, most natural fiber and synthetic ropes uh, and synthetic ropes are this type. Um, these are used exclusively as utility. Some of the disadvantages of laid rope is it's susceptible to abrasion uh, and physical damage. Uh, damage immediately impacts the rope's strength due to the large portion of the load bearing strand that's exposed. So any damage to it, it's not like we have a protective core, any damage to a laid uh, rope will immediately have an impact on the strength and cause um, a potential breakpoint. An advantage of the laid uh, rope is basically strand exposure makes it easy to inspect. We can easily take a look at this rope and see if there's any damage to it. Um, and uh, with the current mantle, we wouldn't necessarily know what's going on in the core. With the laid, all of the structural components of it are right there for us to see. So the one in the middle I have there is the braided rope. Um, and braided is constructed using uniformly intertwining strands of rope uh, together in a diagonal overlapping pattern. Uh, it's less likely to twist during use than laid rope is. Uh, the load bearing fibers are still vulnerable to uh, direct abrasion and damage. It's most commonly used as a utility rope and most are synthetic, but at times you can find some braided rope that are natural. The final kind of type that we have on the screen there is the braid on braid, and that's constructed of a braided core enclosed in a braided herringbone pattern sheath. Uh, it's also known as a double braid rope. Uh, sometimes, just by the look of it, it can be confused with kern mantle, so it's important to know what type of rope you have. Uh, it's very strong. Uh, half of the strength is in its sheath, in the outer covering of it. Uh, the other half is in the core. Disadvantages of braid on braid is it does not resist abrasion as well as kern mantle. The sheath may slide along the intercore. And again, most often this is used as a utility. So if we're going to be using ropes, we need to understand about rope maintenance. We need to know how to care, clean, inspect, and uh, store our rope. So our rope must be properly maintained so it's ready for use when we need it. And, uh, and we're going to look at how we do that. So rope inspection. All types of rope, uh, you know, NFPA 1983 says, you know, talks about inspections and logbooks uh, as far as life safety rope, but all types of rope must be inspected after use. Uh, unused rope should be inspected at least once a year. Inspections uh, for life safety rope need to be documented in a rope log. Uh, and when we're inspecting the rope, we want to inspect both visually and by touch. Uh, so we're going to check for things like um, if there's any embedded shards of glass, are there any metal shavings, wood splinters, um, other foreign objects that might damage the rope. Um, and so that's our first start. Um, with current mantle rope, uh, we'll do an inspection by putting a slight tension on the rope and we want to feel for lumps. That'll tell us if there's any damage to the core. Um, another sign of damage to the core would be soft spots. Um, so we inspect the outer sheath uh, if we find any soft spots. And if the sheath is damaged, the core is likely going to be damaged as well. If we have any doubts about current mantle rope, we're going to remove it from service. This is life safety rope. This is, you know, this is what's going to stop us and protect us. So we're going to make sure that, uh, that any, anything that we have any doubts about is removed from service. We're also going to inspect for irregularities in shape. Um, in the shape of the rope. Uh, maybe the weave has changed somehow. Uh, are there foul smells from the rope? Discoloration from, you know, maybe chemical contamination? Uh, is there any roughness, uh, abrasions, fuzziness? Uh, some fuzziness is normal. Um, if it's excessively fuzzy though, we want to remove it from service. There's no specific guideline on that. Just use your good judgment. 
Uh, the fuzziness just basically means that, you know, you're starting to lose some of the strength in uh, the sheet. So with uh, other types of ropes to inspect, with laid rope, we want to untwist uh, so that all the sides of each, span, uh, each strand can be inspected. Uh, we want to remove any mildew uh, and clean the rope, reinspect it after that. We're going to look for those soft, uh, soft, crusty, brittle spots again. Uh, any extra, uh, any excessive stretching in areas, uh, any cuts, any nicks, abrasions, chemical damage, uh, dirt or grease or any other obvious flaws. Uh, if it's a natural fiber laid rope, uh, we're going to remove from service when it's at the end of its service period, and that's determined by the manufacturer. Uh, we're going to determine the rope age and to do that we're going to have to go back and, and hopefully we're keeping track of when we're purchasing these things and we're able to see when when the rope was purchased. We're going to inspect for signs of damage like we would with Kern Mantle. Uh, so any ruptured fibers. Um, <clears throat> with laid rope you might find some powdering in between the strands. Uh, that's an indication that the, the rope has been overloaded. Uh, dark red, brown, or black spots between the strands or along, along with a sour, musty, or acidic odor, that could be rot or mildew. Uh, <clears throat> any, uh, the powdering between strands can also indicate internal wear. Uh, any brittle or ruptured fibers, oh sorry, uh, yeah, red or dark brown spots, salt incrustations or swollen areas, um, that could be a sign of chemical damage on the rope. <clears throat> Rust spots, uh, they occur on all ropes used with pulleys uh, or other metal devices, but any rust spots on it, that could be a weakening, uh, cause a weak area of the rope as well. Any accumulations of heavy, greasy materials, um, certainly going to impact the rope's strength and reduce the holding power. Uh, and one thing to keep in mind is rot will spread to new rope very quickly. Uh, when it's discovered, we need to remove uh, rotten rope and, and, the, and any surrounding rope from service. We need to clean it and reinspect it. <clears throat> when we clean it, we're going to, after we've cleaned it, we're going to dry it and uh, in a ventilated storage area before we put that wrap, that, uh, that rope back into service. So inspections for braided rope. We're going to inspect it visually for any exterior damage, any nicks, cuts, sears, excessive or unusual fuzziness. Um, we're going to look for any permanent mushy spots or deformities. We're going to feel the rope as we're going, squeeze the surface of the rope. This is really what you got to do. You got to get hands on with rope when you start doing these inspections. <clears throat> with the braid on braid rope, again, visual inspection, any heat sears, nicks, cuts, uh, feel around for lumps, um, that indicates core damage. Uh, the shrinking rope, if the diameter of the rope seems to be getting smaller, that uh, may indicate a break in the core. Examine the sheath to see if there's any damage or uh, questionable wear, something that wasn't there before. Um, and if the sheath slides over the core, cut off the end, pull off the excess material, seal the end. And you can seal the end just by, just by laying the fire on it. Basically. The next part of rope maintenance we want to talk about is caring for our rope. And I put a nice little picture here of a big pile of rope with a bow on it to show us we care for our rope. Um, so when we care, care for rope includes things like avoiding abrasions, right, and any unnecessary wear. Um, ropes can be weakened from surface damage caused by chafing or dragging uh, over splintered, rough, or gritty surfaces. Um, any constant vibration against like an apparatus compartment can, uh, can also cause abrasions. Um, compression uh, when stored in tight spaces, so if we're actually crushing it. So, you know, you want to make sure that you're not doing any of these things when we're storing the rope. Um, we want to avoid any sharp angles and bends when we're using these ropes. Sharp angles and bends, uh, like any knots as well, they can reduce the strength of the rope by as much as 50%. Um, next aspect, we want to protect the ends from damage. We want to prevent it from unravel, uh, unraveling by properly whipping or taping the ends. Um, so again, burning off the end or just tying it with uh, putting some tape around the end. And we don't want to keep sustained loads on our ropes either, right? Natural fiber ropes have less ability to bear those kind of sustained loads than synthetic fiber ropes. Um, but uh, you still don't want to do it with the synthetic either, right? We never want to exceed the load limit of any rope or, sub or subject it to a sustained load for more than two days. We want to avoid things like rust. Rust can weaken the rope uh, in as little as one or two weeks. Uh, if it's rust, if your rope is rust stained, inspect how bad the stain is. Uh, if it's halfway through the rope, rope strength may be reduced by as much as 50%. Remove it from service, right? 
we want to prevent it from contacting chemicals. Uh, natural fiber rope is extremely vulnerable to these kind of things, chemicals and solvents and things. Um, synthetic ropes are not entirely resistant to damage from oils and gasoline and paint and things like that either. Uh, another part of caring for the rope is, ma is making sure we reverse the ends of the rope periodically. And that's, a, that's particularly true with life safety rope. If we have our rope sitting in a rope bag for a long period of time, uh, we want to uncoil the rope, recoil it uh, with the location of the ends changed. So the other end is going to be coming out now and that's going to be our working end from now on. We don't want to walk on, uh, on rope and I think that should go without saying we don't walk on rope. When we walk on rope that grinds dirt, debris into the strands, it'll bruise the strands and, uh, and it will com uh, by, and, uh, damage it by compressing it. Rope cleaning. <clears throat> So rope cleaning, you know, we all, part of our visual examination and our inspection of the rope was looking for things like contamination um, and dirt, soil, glass, anything like that. We want to use a, a stiff bristled brush, uh, brush to remove it. Uh, <clears throat> with synthetic fiber cleaning, we want it, we want it washed in, some, in lukewarm water with a mild detergent um, to loosen the embedded particles. Do not ever use things like strong bleaches or, or, or like bleaches or strong cleaners. Uh, so washing by hand, we want to put the like the photo on the left of this slide. We place the rope in a, a sink filled with water and some mild soap. Uh, we scrub with a bristle brush, um, and we can also soak the mesh in a bag and uh, soak it in a mesh bag, sorry, and then agitate it by hand to remove the grit. So if you have a mesh bag, it's a great way to do it. You soak it in there um, and then just agitate it underneath the, uh, like under the water. Uh, make sure after you're done with this, you're rinsing it thoroughly with clean water. Some departments may have the little device on the slide on the, on the picture on the right here is a rope washing device. Uh, looks very similar, just a smaller kind of style for a hose washer. Uh, you manually feed the rope through this device and it removes the mud, surface debris, um, but you can't use detergent with a, with a rope washing device. Um, there is an option as well as using a washing machine. Uh, front or top loading without the center agitators is, is all you want. If you have a center agitator, it's going to wrap itself around and that's no good. Uh, for that though, you're going to want to place it in a bag, uh, set the washer on the coolest temperature, um, use a very, very small amount of detergent, um, and uh, you might want to rinse the rope clean with a high pressure washer after that. So once we've done cleaning the rope, we want to dry it immediately after, uh, after we've washed and rinsed it. We want to spread that, to do that, we want to spread it out over, you know, we can do things like a hose drying rack would be an option. A hose tower is a great option. Um, loosely coiled uh, and hanging, you know, on a, on a peg somewhere. Um, never near a heat source though, uh, and never in direct sunlight. Uh, with natural fiber cleaning, uh, we want to wipe or gently brush it. We don't use water with natural fibers. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> dry it using the same methods as synthetic rope if it does get wet. Now how to store our ropes. There's two acceptable ways of storing rope. Uh, the first one is photo on the left, the rope bag, uh, and the other one is coiled on the apparatus, photo on the right. So when we're storing rope, it's got to be in a clean, dry, unheated area. Uh, should be uh, some freely circulating air currents as well in there. Uh, we have to protect the weather, for, uh, the rope from weather, including things like direct sunlight. Um, we also have to protect it from chemicals, fumes, vapors, anything like that that can damage or harm the rope. Uh, rope it shouldn't be stored in the same compartment with things like gasoline-powered tools or fuel containers. Uh, there's a good chance of contamination of the rope by, by storing it that way. Uh, by storing it in a bag, it makes it easy to transport and protects it from abrasion uh, and contamination. The bag can be marked with the type of rope, the size, uh, the, who it's assigned to, like if, it, if it's uh, what, what apparatus it's assigned to, um, and if it's a life safety rope, you might even have the rope logged right attached to the, uh, to the rope bag. The, the, one of the great things with the, with the rope bag is uh, these bags are actually designed so that they can be thrown or dropped uh, for a quick deployment of the rope. And so using, you use those a lot for things like hand lines, 
you know, if you needed something to hold on to when you're going down a low angle. So last, uh, I guess, uh, on the same lines as rope is webbing. Uh, webbing is made from the same materials used to make synthetic rope. Um, there's two different types of, uh, of webbing, uh, and I have both of those in the photo on the left there. Uh, the, there is flat or tubular. And you can see the flat one in, uh, in his, well, it's in his right hand on the left side, and the tubular is the, uh, the green one there. Uh, webbing is typically used for life safety. Uh, it, webbing that is used for life safety applications also has to be NFPA compliant. So flat webbing can, is basically just consisted of a, consists of a single layer of material. It's kind of like a seat belt. Uh, it's less expensive than tubular, uh, stiffer and more difficult to tie into knots than tubular, and uh, mainly used for straps, harnesses, things like that. Uh, tubular webbing is more supple, easier to tie, uh, and tubular webbing is what we would use for rescue applications. Uh, there's two types of tubular webbing, and they are, uh, the first one is edge stitched, which is formed by taking a piece of flat webbing and uh, folding it lengthwise, and then sewing the edges together. Um, that kind of, the edge stitched can become uh, unstitched through, through normal wear. Um, if it uh, suffers abrasions, um, but the other type is called spiral weave, also known as uh, shuttle loom construction. It's constructed by weaving a tube uh, as one complete unit. So there is no stitch on the edge there. Uh, the threads basically spiral, spiral around the tube as it's woven. So with webbing, we have a few different uses for it. Things like uh, life safety, like I talked about, has to be certified to NFPA 1983 if we're using it for life safety. Uh, utility webbing, again, like utility rope, is not regulated by the standard. Uh, <clears throat> but if we are putting a load on it, it must be able to support that load plus a safety factor, right? Uh, utility webbing uses, some of the things you might find yourself using webbing for, and I'm sure many of you have this in your pocket already. It's amazing what we can do with webbing. You can use it to secure hose rolls and bundles together. Uh, you can use it for raising and lowering tools, same as you would with utility rope. Uh, you can use it as part of a search line system. You can use it to secure doors and hatches in the open position, so door control. You can use it for carrying hose. You can use it for carrying SCBA cylinders and equipment. Uh, you can control the inward swinging door when it's being forced open uh, so that it doesn't go too far. Uh, you can use it for pulling unconscious or incapacitated people out of hazardous areas. Uh, again, we view, you know, in, in RIT classes, we often use, before we had the drag rescue device, it was webbing that we would use to actually take a, a downed firefighter out of the building. Um, we also, you know, in, for departments that do auto extrication, securing a vehicle roof when it's folded back uh, is another use for webbing, controlling the doors on the cars as well. Um, while you know, while it's being opened, while that door is being opened by spreaders during the extrication process. So with webbing care and maintenance, same guidelines as synthetic ropes for care, cleaning, and maintenance, basically. And we always want to follow manufacturer's instructions. Uh, for storing webbing, uh, we might be carrying up you know twenty to thirty feet of webbing you know in, in on us, and uh, it's a great idea to have it. It's a very useful tool to have in your coat, in your coat pocket, your pants pocket. Um, long lengths of webbing, we can uh, roll them into daisy chains, like the, the photo on the right of this slide is a daisy chain. And for those of you who have ever stored a rope like that, it's, it's an excellent way to store the webbing. Uh, and basically, you just grab onto one end, you kind of give it a jerk, and the entire webbing will come out ready for use. <clears throat> so we've talked about ropes for a while now. Let's talk about knots. <clears throat> so Knots, basically, what do we use them for? We use them to join ropes and webbing together. Uh, or, you know, sometimes we use them for, you know, hauling tools, we can use them for, you know, door control, all different kinds of things. Uh, it's a critical part of firefighting and rescue operations. Um, so with the rope, we have three different parts that we, we talk about when we're discussing knots and the use of ropes. Um, so we're talking about the working end. The working end is the end of the rope that's used to tie the knot. All right, the running part is the free end that's used for hoisting and pulling. And the standing part is the section between the working end and the running end. So with knots, they always need to be tightened until they're snug. 
uh, we want to remove any slack after tying them, uh, after tying. And uh, removing slack, that's known as dressing the knot, all right? Uh, there are knots that are used to prevent knot failure. The overhand safety knot on the left um, is tied in the tail of the working end of the, knot, uh, of the, of the rope. Uh, and a hitch is a temporary knot undone by, that's typically undone by pulling against the strain that holds it. We'll talk about some of the elements of a knot. <clears throat> because uh, when we're talking about knots, we want to be all, all use the same kind of terminology, right? Uh, so knot, knots have to be easy to tie. Uh, they must be secure under load. And uh, we, want to we want that knot to reduce the rope strength as little as possible. Uh, a tighter bend will lead to more strength being lost. So a weaker, weaker rope, the, the tighter the bend is on that knot. So the three different bends that are created when tying a knot or a hitch are on your screen right now. Uh, the first is called a bite. A bite is a U-shape created by bending the rope with uh, two sides parallel, very straightforward. It's just you bend it over on itself, that U-shape there, that's a bite. A loop is a piece of rope that's formed into a circle. And a round term, a turn is formed by bending a rope in and on, in on itself several times. So it's basically a, a round turn is multiple loops. So again, like I said at the beginning of the knot part here, we, we need to know several different types of knots. We use them for a, ver a variety of reasons. Uh, the first easiest and in some ways very important knot is the overhand safety knot. It's used as a safety measure when tying other knots. Uh, this is not a knot we're going to actually use to do the work. This is a knot to keep our other knots in place. It secures the working end of the rope. So the overhand safety knot also, you know, it helps to eliminate the danger of the running end slipping back through the knot and causing a knot failure, right? So by putting this overhand safety knot at the bottom of every one of our knots that we do, we're preventing the chance, we're, we're lessening the chance that it's going to become undone and cause a failure of the rope and, and the knot that we, that we tie. The next knot that I have on the screen here is called the bowline. <clears throat> it's one of the most important knots in the fire service. It's easily tied and untied, very good for forming a simple loop that, will, that, uh, that won't constrict on itself. And I'm not going to be tying knots for you today, but this is something that you'll be learning at your departments with uh, your training officers during your practical assessments. All right. Next one we'll talk about is a half hitch. <clears throat> so a half hitch is really just useful. It's, it's useful for stabilizing long objects that are being hoisted. Uh, it's, a half hitch is never used by itself. It's always combined with other knots or hitches. So a half hitch is basically just formed by making a round turn around an object and the standing part passes under the round turn on the opposite side. So you can see here what, what that is. There's a round turn on that half hitch. And then the 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 working end, the running basically the standing part comes up, and the running end comes uh, from underneath it. On the right, we have the clove hitch. A uh, clove hitch is essentially two half hitches. Um, the principal use of a of a clove hitch is to attach the uh, the rope to an object. Uh, it's not appropriate for using a clove hitch for any kind of life safety applications, um, and a clove hitch can be formed anywhere in the rope. And you can do it around an object, or you can do it, you know, and, and slide it onto an object. So figure eight, uh, figure eight knot is the foundation knot of the entire family of figure eight knots. And there are a number of different types of figure eight knots. And uh, we'll talk about a couple more as we go on here. Um, figure eight knot can be used as a stopper knot, so the rope doesn't pass through a rescue pulley or, uh, or the grommet of the rope bag. Uh, and that's typically what you're going to be using the figure of eight for. So the figure eight on a bite is, uh, is a great way to tie a, uh, a large closed loop. So you see the bite there is that large loop at the end of it, uh, U-shape bend. Uh, so the figure eight on a bite is tied by forming a bite on the rope to start with. And then you tie a simple figure eight uh, knot uh, with the bite in, in, uh, double, in doubling over on the rope. Another figure eight knot, the figure eight follow through. Uh, figure eight follow through is used for things like securing objects. Uh, it's basically just a figure eight on a bite that's, uh, that's around an object. Uh, 
<clears throat> so the difference between this is that we're not forming the byte to start with. We're actually, you know, creating a figure of eight, creating a large loop, and then crossing over and following the rope back through uh, the figure eight uh, again. <clears throat> The next uh, knot that I do have on the screen here is called the Beckett Bend. Uh, Beckett Bend isn't one we typically use too, opt uh, too often, but it's used for joining two ropes of unequal length, uh, of unequal diameters, or joining uh, rope and chain together. Uh, it's unlikely to slip this, this type of knot when the rope is wet, uh, but it as well is not suitable for life safety. And the last knot that I have on the, in, in this presentation is uh, the water knot. Uh, water knot is the preferred knot for joining two pieces of webbing or the ends of a single piece of webbing uh, when, when you need a big loop. Um, it tends to actually get fairly strong. Like when wet, it's, it's a very strong knot, but it has the ability and, and tendency at times, you know, when dry to slip. It's important to make sure that when we're, when we're tying a water knot, we have to dress it properly. Uh, the, the webbing actually ends up flipping over on itself. Uh, it doesn't follow itself, pro like it doesn't follow, it doesn't, uh, doesn't seem to kind of mesh together very well at times. So we need to dress it so it looks just like it looks in this photo. Nice, tight, clean. Um, and you always want to allow at least three inches at the end of it for, for the tail. Just give you a little bit of room to work with. So one of the big things will be that we could be found you you know using ropes for is hoisting of tools and equipment, right? Uh, so things uh, hoisting is like uh, high pressurized cylinders, like SCBA bottles. Uh, never do that. All right. I don't know if WorkSafe says you can't do it, but do not do that uh, for obvious reasons. We drop an SCBA bottle or a high pressure cylinder, there's going to be big problems, right? Um, Make sure the way to prevent any kind of equipment damage uh, when we is to just make sure you're using proper knots and and securing procedures. You know, you often hear it said, if you don't know knots, tie lots. That's not a that's not a good way to think about it when we're dealing with you know very you know heavy tools, expensive tools, and it's not safe. This is why we learn how to do the proper knots. Uh, we can use things like a control or a tag line. Um, I'm pretty sure that's what he's doing at the on, in the picture here. Um, the tagline helps us control, you know, longer objects that are being that are being hoisted, maybe uh, pike poles, things like that, uh, where it, you know, where the bottom of it, it's it can be hard to control. It might start smashing against the building to prevent damage. We might want to control it from the bottom as well. Uh, and always with like with everything we do, we keep safety first when we're selecting the method of hoisting any tools or equipment. Uh, some of the hardware that may come into play sometimes, things like a carabiner on the left. Um, carabiner, for those that don't know, is a snap link made of aluminum, titanium, possibly steel, um, and it's uh, with a sprung or screwed gate, a screwed gate on it, uh, and that'll help us connect the ropes to to other mechanical gear. Uh, and then on the right, we have a pulley uh, used to create a mechanical advantage for us and help us with you know, so we're not carrying as much of the load when we're having to hoist. Um, this pulley, you know, and pulleys typically consist of you know a grooved wheel. Uh, that we put the rope through, and uh, can run, and it can run to change direction or the point of application of force that's applied on the rope. So no longer are we pulling straight, you know, having to go straight up. We're actually being able to 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 pull down because our pulley is higher and it changes the direction of our pull. So some things to keep in mind: safety aspects when we're hoisting tools and equipment. Anytime before we start, uh, make sure you're physically balanced and standing on firm ground. Uh, we want to use the hand over hand method uh, to maintain control over the rope. So we're never letting go of the rope. We've always got a point of contact. Uh, we can consider if we have them, you know, using an edge roller or padding to protect our rope. We don't have an edge, ro an edge roller. Padding does, uh, can, is, is better than nothing, right? Uh, and that'll help protect the rope when we need to pull, it, pull things over sharp edges. Uh, in this case, they've got it over a jersey barrier on the, sh on the photo on the left. Uh, we want to use pulley systems for heavy objects uh, if we have them. Uh, we want to work in teams when we're working from heights. Um, make sure other personnel that aren't involved in the hoisting are away from the hoisting area. Uh, we want to avoid hoisting operations, and this goes with it, just like ladders. Anything near electrical hazards, um, if it's not, you know, 
if it's not possible and you have to, you know, hoist to a certain area that's near, uh, you know, electrical hazards, uh, extreme caution has to be used and maybe you want to reconsider your plan of attack on that. Uh, we can also use, we want to secure nozzles of any charged hose line to prevent uh, them from ac accidentally discharging. And we're going to show you how to hoist, you know, charged hose lines as well during the, uh, the practical component of this. Uh, and we do it in a way that actually keeps the bale closed on the, on the nozzle. Uh, like I mentioned before, we want to use a tag line uh, to help us control uh, anything that we're hoisting. And avoid hoisting tools and equipment if it's safe. Like if we don't have to hoist, don't hoist, right? If we can hand it or carry it up uh, some stairs or a ladder, just do it that way instead. Okay, so we'll talk about hoisting an axe. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a pick head, a flat head axe, just any kind of axe, this technique is gonna work. Uh, you can use another, you can use a different, you can use the same rope that you're using to hoist the rope. You can actually use it as a tagline as well. If you leave yourself uh, enough of the, uh, of the running end at the, uh, at the bottom there. So the procedure for hoisting an axe, um, either a bowline, a clove hitch, or a figure, uh, figure eight on a bite, uh, we use that at the axe head. Uh, so you're basically making something with a loop in it. Uh, unless it's, uh, you know, the clove hitch is, is a little bit different, but with the figure eight and the bowline, um, the loop will pass over the head of the ax, and then as you see, it kind of pat it's over the head, and th that's a clove hitch in the picture that we have on the screen there. So they tied a clove hitch, they brought the rope over the ax head, and then back up the shaft of the ax, and then a half hitch is tied near the top of the ax. Uh, the other ways of doing that is if you're using a figure eight on a bite, the loop would go over top of the ax head and then the, the running part would then come back down same way as the rope is going over the head of this ax with a half hitch at the top. Bowline, same, same idea as the, as the figure of eight uh, where we've got a loop, we've tied our bowline, we put the loop over the head, we bring the rope back over the head of the ax and, uh, and tie a half hitch on the handle. So hoisting a pike pole. So this is a, you know, this is a, an important one to know. This is something that often gets that, uh, you know, somebody working on a second story may need at some point in time. And instead of putting somebody else into the building, it is actually a more, you know, uh, it's a better idea to think about maybe hoisting it up to them. Um, when we're hoisting the, a pike pole, we want to raise it with the head up, right? Uh, we do not want to create a dagger that if it, does, if it were to fall becomes a spear falling down on your comrades below. Uh, so we want to tie a clove hitch uh, somewhere near the butt end of the handle. Uh, and, then another, and then another around the head. So two basically in total. In this case, it's, uh, it's basically, you can see here they're doing the clove hitch up at the head and then they've got two half hitches going up the handle. And they've left enough room on the running end uh, to you to act as a tagline. Uh, you can see how they're using that to make sure that the that the pike pole doesn't come back in smashing against the building. Another thing that we may end up having to to hoist and is quite common is uh, a ladder. Uh, so with a ladder, uh, again, it's the bowline or the figure eight on a bite. And with that, what we're doing is we're actually gonna slip it or, uh, through two rungs of the ladder, about one third of the way from the top. Um, we're gonna pull the, lip, uh, the, pull the loop through, uh, through the ladder, so through the rungs, and then slip it over the top of the ladder. Uh, basically what you've done now is you, you've just you've lassoed that, uh, that ladder. Uh, so you see here, the, uh, it looks like they did a figure eight on a bite in the picture on the left. Uh, the loop, they brought it down, <clears throat> and they put it under, it's about three rungs down. And then they took that big loop, brought it back over the top of the ladder. And now if they're to pull up, you can see how it, hold, it would hold on to that ladder. There. Hoisting a dry hose line. So hoisting hose lines, a lot of times this is the fastest and safest ways to get, uh, to get a hose line up to uh, above grade. Um, we want to be careful though when we're doing it this way. We want to, to avoid damaging the nozzle or the couplings. Uh, and it's 
often safer and easier to hoist a dry hose line than it is for a charged hose line. So for a dry hose line, uh, you can see here, we're gonna fold the nozzle back over the rest of the hose line and we're gonna fold it back about four to five feet. Uh, we're gonna place a half hitch, uh, <clears throat> we're gonna place a half hitch on the overlap, as you see on the photo on the left there. And that's gonna be approximately one foot from the loop end. Uh, so then we're going to tie just up at the nozzle, just up in the nozzle area, we're going to tie um, a clove hitch with a safety knot around the nozzle. Uh, and uh, as well as it goes right around the, the hose that is pressed, that is uh, folded against it. So then basically all we need to do is hoist after that's done. The loop end should be on the, on the high side. So again, you're gonna have that loop part on the, that's, that you can see in the left picture uh, on the high side, actually on the right picture, it's a great, great shot. And you can use the hose itself as the tagline to, uh, to prevent the nozzle from coming back in at the building. Hoisting a charged hose line. A little bit different. So again, our big concern when we're doing a charged hose line is we do not want that bale to open up and accidentally discharge water. Uh, so a little bit of a different technique between a charged and uh, and a uh, and an uncharged hose line. So with the with the charged hose line, we want to tie a clove hitch uh, with a safety knot around the hose, and you can see that in the photo on the left there. They've got the clove hitch right there and we just have to take their word on it that they did a safety knot. Uh, we then tie a half hitch around the nozzle and uh, we, we pass the bite through the nozzle bale and loop it back over the nozzle so that the rope holds the nozzle shut while it's being hoisted. It's, an, it's, a, it's a really slick little technique when you actually get out to the halls and are able to try it. Uh, the rope itself passes back, uh, basically comes over the nozzle and keeps the no and keep, or comes back over the bale and keeps it from opening up accidentally. You can then hoist the hose line, nozzle end up. Same thing, you can use the hose itself as the tagline for that hoist. And we'll talk about hoisting a power saw. Because there are times when we may have to hoist a power saw. Hoisting a power saw is pretty straightforward. Basically, we want to secure the rope to the handle using a figure eight on a bite or a bolt. Um, and in this case, it looks like they're using a figure eight on a bite. So they actually tied the figure eight on a bite right with, with the bite being around the handle of the saw. We want to leave enough excess at the running end to use uh, as a guide or a tagline, and then simply hoist the saw. So the running end, basically on the running end, that's your tagline person on the top using the working end, using the working end and, uh, and then you've got your saw in the middle and the stand. So this was one of our shorter presentations. Uh, a lot of ropes and knots is actually something we need to do, you know, hands on. And without having the ability to be with you right now, I, you know, I would have liked to have been tying knots with you, but it's, you know, me sitting here tying a knot isn't going to really help. A lot of us are hands on learners. Looking forward to when we can get back together again. So we use our ropes and knots, we use webbing and things like that to hoist tools and equipment, stabilize objects, uh, it helps us, you know, sometimes we even use ropes to, to designate control zones, you know, don't go in here. Um, helps us perform rescues and escape from life-threatening situations. Uh, to use them safely and effectively, we have to know the different types of, of, of ropes, the different, their applications, how to tie a variety of, of knots, and how to do it quickly and correctly. Finally, we also have to know how to inspect, clean, maintain our ropes so that they're ready to use when we need them. Thank you guys, thank you all again for, uh, for joining us uh, tonight. I'm going to stop the recording now and if there are any questions, I'll take them now. <laughs>